Hello, Trinity Tigers, and welcome to Learning Together. This is a live seminar series or webinar, part of a lifelong learning initiative by Trinity University's Office of Alumni Relations. My name is John Herman. I am a political science professor for the last quarter of a century. I have an expertise in constitutional law, and I do research on Supreme Court decision making and I've had a uh, profound and deep interest in the Supreme Court since I was a undergraduate many moons ago. Um, today, I, I think we're, we're deeply honored. Um, I'm gonna be the moderator, but the featured speaker is gonna be G General William Souter, and he has had 50 years of um, distinguished public service. He is a Vietnam veteran. He served in the military, and he uh, was appointed by the Supreme Court of the United States to be the clerk of the court, which is the chief administrator of the court. And today's discussion is going to be on the retirement of Associate Justice Anthony Kennedy and what the implications of his retirement will be for the future of the Supreme Court. Um, many court watchers have been figuring that he was the swing vote, meaning that when the court was divided, he would be the determinative vote in key cases such as abortion and gay rights. And um, historically, we've, we've always looked at the court by the chief justice, but more recently, as the court has become more and more divided and politics has become more and more divided in society, we look at the court by that swing vote, that determinative vote. And Kennedy was our most recent swing vote. And prior to that, um, Sandra Day O'Connor was the swing vote, and prior to that was Powell. But with Kennedy leaving the court, many fear, um, particularly liberals, fear that the court is going to move in sort of, a, sort of a seismic shift to the right, and the political sky will fall, and, uh, and that the court will be conservative for the next uh, several decades. And conservatives, many believe that the court will be, uh, become very conservative bound and it will be very pro-business and, and that it has locked a sort of conservative um, ideal on the Supreme Court. And General Souter is here today to help clear up these issues and explain what this means. And I am gonna ask him a series of questions and he's going to answer them. And we're gonna talk about what this means to the court and you're welcome to call in and talk to us about your views on the court and, and General Souter would be glad to answer any questions you may have. And my first question to General Souter is, is it really this simple that we have five people that are conservative on the court and that means that all Supreme Court decisions from here and after will be conservative and that the liberals will be locked out of the decision-making process of the judiciary. Thank you very much. Uh, and Dr. Herman, I want to thank you and the Trinity staff for creating and producing this program. And also, I thank all of you for dialing in out there and participating in the program, especially my classmates and those that my wife, Jeannie, and I went to school with at Trinity. And lastly, Jeannie and I are very proud to be Trinity graduates. We still like to support the school because I think it's just the finest educational institution in America. It gave us a great foundation for life. So, no, it's not that simple. Uh, it's not even simple being appointed to the court, as we see on television every day now. Uh, it's, it's messy, but nobody said that the constitutional process had to be uh, not messy at all. Uh, here's one thing. People talk about five to four decisions. The Supreme Court annually nowadays has between about 75 and 85 opinions a year that are opinions of the court that are signed, not summary dispositions and things like that. Uh, or nine to nothing. Right, unanimous. You don't read about those because uh, no one seems to be interested, particularly the media, in bankruptcy or, or taxation or, or a patent case. That stuff is pretty boring, but it's extremely important. Uh, the five to four decisions, I think generally there may be 10 to 15 percent, maybe more in one term than another, but when you work on percentages here, it's really misleading because the court doesn't have that many opinions. Back in the 1980s, 
the court was issuing maybe 140, 150 opinions. But Congress passed uh, some legislation later that reduced the caseload because so many cases were coming from three judge district courts directly to the Supreme Court. It wasn't a selection process. Now the court has certiorari discretion. Uh, they can either uh, grant a petition or deny the petition. So the court has the luxury of only taking those cases where there basically is a split in the lower circuits on how to interpret a law uh, or it's of great importance that's never been uh, looked at before. So the court is very selective in, in which cases uh, that it takes. So uh, five to four, six to three, I've seen opinions, uh, everything from from five to four to, to seven to two. It, uh, it just depends on the case. So I don't think you can really categorize the court by numbers or, or by percentages. And that, and that leads to my uh, next question. It seems that uh, court watchers look at the change in the composition of the Supreme Court, yet our Constitution has not changed much, has it? I mean, 27 amendments and 10 of them were ratified in 1791. So how can precedent or, you know, uh, cases that serve and are determinative as the law of the land just change by the composition of the court on a whim if the Constitution is a more of a static document? Yeah, the Constitution is a static document, very difficult to change, as we know, and the drafters wanted it that way. You have some nations that have a Constitution that's changed many, many times every year. Well, it's not very stable. That's not a good idea. So it, it's hard to amend the Constitution, and that's the way uh, I think most good thinkers think it, it, it should be. Uh, also, a point here, the, the Supreme Court tries to avoid interpreting the Constitution. Now, here's why. Once you do it, you interpret an article or, or one of the Bill of Rights or something, you're stuck with it. Uh, the court will avoid interpreting the Constitution and try to interpret a statute passed by Congress or find some other way to reach, reach a decision. So there aren't the, 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 most of the constitutional questions that come before the court are First Amendment, free speech, freedom of the press, uh, that sort of thing, uh, Fifth Amendment. Uh, right against self-incrimination, Fourth Amendment, searches and seizures, Eighth Amendment, um, unusual, cruel and unusual punishment. But you don't see a lot of other articles of, of, the, of the Constitution are uh, uh, interpreted by the court. So when a new justice comes aboard, uh, the court doesn't change immediately. Now, some justices, Justice White told me one time, the great Justice Byron White, that um, every time there's a new justice, it's a new court. Other justices told me, including Justice Scalia, it's not a new court. A new person comes aboard, and he or she has to learn what's going on and and uh, and be a part of the team. Uh, Justice Thomas told me one time that when he was appointed to the court, one of the senior justices took him aside and said, "Clarence, you'll spend the first five years wondering how you got here." <laughs> you'll spend the next five years wondering how the other eight got here. So um, uh, they're individuals. Uh, they don't have a label stamped on their forehead, L for liberal, or C for conservative, uh, or T for tardy. They, they, they all have their own ideologies. They're all very, very bright. And so uh, you, you can't determine how a justice is going to vote. I know in, in political science, that's part of the, I'm not going to say game, part, part of the education is studying that sort of thing, and I think that's good, but you just can't determine. I was the clerk for 22 years, and I watched over 1,700 arguments in the courtroom with the court. Uh, before every argument, I would circle on the day call sheet which side I thought would prevail. And I really never got above about 72 or 3% and never below about 64, 65 percent. So I was kind of in the middle there. Uh, but, you know, you're right there all the time. You think, well, I can determine what's going to be happening here. Sometimes I was wrong nine to nothing. <laughs> I felt stupid. Now, those are usually things I didn't know much about, like patent, patent law or intellectual property. But uh, you just can't determine what a justice is going to do. And that's been proven through history time and time again. Yes, there sure have been a lot of surprises in Supreme Court decisions, and I will reaffirm that political scientists do like to think that they can explain or even predict future decisions, but we sure do get it wrong, and we, <laughs> so I'm, I'm the first to admit that. I've, I've been called on the media to 
do that. That's a, that's a very interesting and uncanny insight. So let's just assume for a second that these justices will play the devil's advocate, are uh, black-robed homo sapiens. They are people with political ideologies. They're partisans. They just want certain outcomes. With Associate Justice Anthony Kennedy's departure, does that mean that Roe versus Wade, which has been precedent since 1973, is going to be overturned at some point in, in the near future? And, and those that are liberal are, are very worried about bodily autonomy and the issue of gay rights. And some are very concerned today about environmental rights. Can one justice tip the, the scale of all these issues that are so divisive in America that also are debated and there's a lot of dialogue with Congress and the president and the states, I might add. Yeah, um, a lot of people think that way. It, it, it's sort of silly, quite frankly, uh, to think that one justice comes aboard and tells the other eight, eight here's the game plan while I'm here. We're going to reverse Roe v. Wade. We're going to go back to Plessy versus Ferguson. We're going to do this. It, it, it is a, the game's not played that way. It's not a game. The cases come in. The cases go out. There might not be another abortion issue in front of the court for two decades. Who knows? It depends what the states do. It's a state law question as well. So uh, no one knows. But nobody comes in with an agenda. And the court doesn't huddle every term and say, it's a new term. Let's focus on the Fourth Amendment and really be tough on crime. It doesn't work. The cases come in. We don't, we don't call for the cases and say, send us up a good abortion case. No. They come in or, or they don't come in. So uh, the court selects which cases to hear. I think it's a very fair process, and that's a whole science within itself of how that goes on. But um, uh, no, one, one justice doesn't come in. And the people that are screaming that if the new justice who's replacing Justice Kennedy is going to tip the scales and so on and so forth, that's really not even – I can't even take it seriously. But, but they say it and do it, and a lot of people believe it. They have a perfect right to believe it. They have a perfect right to be wrong, so uh, I, uh, I I just don't get it why people think that. I think a lot of people like to be emotional. Uh, they like to parade. They like to wear funny clothes. Uh, they like to uh, uh, um, parade in front of the Supreme Court. A little uh, footnote here. One time at the Supreme Court, there was a demonstration going on. They have to stay a certain number of feet away from it. And uh, I was standing out there beside the court with Justice White. And uh, they were demonstrating out there some, something or other. And a fellow that was in that group broke away from the crowd. And he had purple hair and earrings in his nose. Nothing wrong with that. I knew he wasn't a Trinity student when I saw that. <laughs> but uh, he runs up to Justice White and me and says, Hey, you guys work here at the Supreme Court? And within a nanosecond, Justice White points to me and says, He does. <laughs> so, that he walked off. So I'm caught with the, with the pink hair or blue haired guy, purple hair, whatever it was, and I had to explain to him, uh, well, that didn't take long. I walked away also. Uh, but uh, people think these things out there uh, and parade and demonstrate. They have a right to do it. That's fine. I think that's a great part of this nation. You can parade, but you shouldn't disrupt. Now, I was really disappointed in the uh, Senate, or Senate Judiciary Committee hearings recently when people were interrupting and so forth. That's not freedom of speech. Uh, that's something different. That's being lack of civility. But that's just my view. Thank you for the answer. Uh, it, it is interesting. The court has been political sized because um, on the anniversary of Roe versus Wade, they, they, you know, many interest groups and organized interests walk past the White House, they walk past the halls of Congress, and they choose the Supreme Court to lobby. So it, it seems that the American public, a, a distinct um, part of the American public and the media think that the Supreme Court um, will make decisions based on how organized interests and lobbyists think. And, and this is a question as clerk of the court, do you have any trepidation how the media portrays the court to the public and how the public views the court? If you were to give, um, I guess, prudential advice on this issue, what would you say to our, you know, to our viewers today and listeners and about the legitimacy of the Supreme Court and how the media sees it? Uh, that's really maybe in two parts, John. Uh, the first part is, does demonstrating uh, and, and writing the court 
uh, convince any justice or any law clerk to do anything? No, of course not. One time uh, in the 90s, uh, I got a call that they said down in the basement they'd received several hundred boxes filled with one-page petitions signed by the great citizens of California urging the court to vote a certain way on a tax case. And the t case really went back to uh, Proposition 13. Most of the viewers are too young to even know what that was, and I won't, miss, I won't go into it, but they said, you just got to vote this way. And I opened several of the boxes. They're all the same, pre-printed, but signed by different people it looked like. So I took one and went up to Chief Justice Rehnquist, and I said, we have about you know, 200,000 of these <laughs> documents <laughs> in the basement. And he was such a, he said, well, Bill, what do you think we should do with them? I said, sir, I'm going to have them recycled. He said, <laughs> Very well. Uh, you, you can't have the court. Uh, if it's a letter to a justice, yeah, it'll be read by somebody, but they can't be influenced. The late Justice uh, Scalia, who uh, I admired very much, uh, often gave uh, talks, and a lot of times I was with him to introduce and be a part of the program. And uh, he said that in his 30 years plus on the bench, on the D.C. Circuit and the Supreme Court, not once anyone ever approach him and try to convince him to vote one way or the other. That's just a part of our culture. Now, the crazies write letters and things. Sure, they're going to do that, but that, that's you, they have a right to do it. That's fine, but we have a right not to look at it. Uh, but no, that just doesn't happen at all. And I don't know why so many people think they can influence the court by the marching and demonstrating and writing letters. And so it doesn't do any good. It shows maybe that they're interested in the case, but it's not going to have any influence, none. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna piggyback on that question. I think it's really interesting. Um, obviously, we have the two attorneys, and um, it's my understanding that both parties have to get acceptance in the Supreme Court. But there are what we call friend of the court briefs, and I, I am sure at some points in time, those types of briefs might have some influence if they have strong legal arguments. And these are organized interests that are using the court, but they're using it in, in an appropriate way. Obviously, the Solicitor General has the most influence. Yeah. The amicus curiae briefs are friends of the court. Yeah. Uh, when a petition is filed at the court, uh, that means you've lost, usually in a lower federal court, and you're saying to the Supreme Court, here's the issue in my case, the question presented. It might be... The, did the judge commit an error when he instructed the jury, so on and so forth? There's only one question in each case, rarely two questions. And at that point, you try to convince the court they should hear this case. It's of national importance. There's a split in the circuits, on and on and on. The other side files a brief and says, you don't want to hear this case. Now, not many amicus cases, uh, briefs are filed at the petition stage. It just won't influence the court. They're either going to take it or not. You can almost look at a case open it and look at the question presented and tell whether they're going to take it. If the question is, the soup is too cold uh, at Formosa prison and that violates my rights, the chances are not good that the case is going to be taken. Uh, but otherwise, uh, they take the case, grant the petition, and now the briefs that come in are on the merits. Here's why I think I should win. Here's why I think I should win. And then the amicus briefs, we've had as many as a hundred in the gun control case, Heller and McDonald and that sort of thing. Lots of lots of briefs come in and there are uh, lawyers out there that uh, sort of make a living writing these. And sometimes they're not helpful, but someone reads every one of them, I'll tell you that, to see what's in there. But sometimes they can be very, very influential. The most important one was written many years ago. It's called the Brandeis brief. Uh, Justice Brandeis wrote it as a lawyer and it concerned uh, the uh, uh, child labor laws in New York, I believe, when children were working so many hours, too many hours a day and so forth. And it, his brief wasn't just about the law, it was about the uh, sociological and psychological problems that involved with these children working that many hours a day, filled with statistics and so forth. Most lawyers said, my goodness, what's he doing? He can't do this. It was very persuasive to the court, and hence the term the Brandeis brief has gone since then. Uh, so uh, the, the apex of your life is if the court cites your brief, your amicus brief, in its opinion. Uh, lawyers uh, pen a medal on their 
coat. <laughs> I think that's, that's well. It is really wonderful if if they do that. So uh, some others call those briefs. They're green in color. The color is green on the cover. The lawyer's full employment bill. But uh, uh, they write them, and they can be very helpful. And sometimes a person will want to argue a case and show how their party has an interest, especially the United States. And the court will grant them 10 minutes of the 30 minutes to argue as an amicus curiae. So it really it really helps that everybody gets to say, uh, speak their piece if, it, if they have a legitimate interest. Yeah, and that, that, that Brandeis brief came out, I think came out of Mueller versus Oregon, if I remember correctly. Yes. Uh, it was, yes. I think it was like 111 pages and only three pages dealt with actual yeah. statutes and precedent and the rest was social science. Uh, data. So this is something that I, I, um, it's a normative question of how things ought to work, but as someone who is a clerk on the Supreme Court and you've watched many justices come and go, they're extraordinarily bright, what kind of advice would you give to a justice if before they got on the court? What makes a good justice versus, I don't know, in, in sort of a justice that doesn't use their authority correctly in terms of it. I know we have questions on how to interpret the Constitution, and you even s stated earlier that we should stay away from that. But we have activists, we have restrainists, and so forth. What would you yeah, consider to be a good justice? Those are ideological of some people. Let's just face it. Let's, let's use the word L and C, liberal and conservative. They're, they're more political terms, but they're so handy to use, we can use them in discussing the law. Uh, a liberal who believes in a living constitution. A lot of people disagree and say, how can it be, say one thing one day and one the next? Uh, conservatives, a lot of people say they're strict constructionists. That's really not the right term to use. Uh, the, Justice Scalia always said they're textualists, our original meaning. In other words, if, if Congress wants to change something, change it. You can't change the constitution, but if you don't like the result, you, know, you, you can change it. So you have these two different thoughts, but they meld. They come together, uh, the cases then get uh, discussed and so forth, and, and you get a result. And it's usually not one side or the other. Sometimes, I'm not going to say cutting a deal, they don't do that, but sometimes a little compromise, which Congress should take a lesson from, uh, they yeah. compromise and they get the opinions out. Look, the Supreme Court is the only federal institution that I know of that starts on time and ends on time. <laughs> they want it that way. And I like it that way too, being from the Army. Uh, they get the opinions out, they start the first Monday in October, and they finish by the end of June. That's it. They get they get the work done, and sometimes they have to compromise not their soul or their conscience, but their, their views uh, about a case. And uh, the Constitution doesn't change, but let's look at this, John. Uh, cases that we get today dealing with um, uh, IT, information technology, or the Internet, uh, there was no Internet way back then, but they can handle these cases because laws come along to uh, not interpret the Constitution, but they fall in line with the Constitution. Look, there was one last term. Last term, most, I shouldn't say, most, a lot of people would say uh, the most important case that came down was Master Cake, and that dealt with a baker in um, Colorado who would not, because of religious reasons, bake a specialized wedding case for two people who are getting uh, same sex a marriage. Um, okay, they said that was a big, big case. It really wasn't at all because the court found sort of another reason uh, to rule. Uh, we won't go into all that. That's, that's really different. But another case came out was South Dakota versus Wayfair. And this dealt with a state taxing a sale of goods that took place outside the state. In other words, the Amazon sales and all the others. Wayfair happened to be one of the parties here. Uh, back in 1992, the court had ruled if the sale didn't take place within South Dakota, South Dakota couldn't couldn't uh, um, impose a tax on that transaction. But back in 1992, there was only X number of dollars spent on uh, mail order stuff. Now, states are losing about $30 billion they're avoiding to pay because they're outside the state. The court looked at that, at this term, and in Wayfair looked at it and said, you know, the Constitution didn't change, but we're not wedded to a rule that says everything has to take place within a state because 
technology has changed. And I think it was a very good example of why not to live by stare decisis, that means according to precedent, all the time. Sometimes you, you deviate from it. Brown versus Board of Education deviated from Plessy versus Ferguson, right? Uh, uh, the Dred Scott case, for heaven's sakes, deviated from Sometimes a case just needs to be overruled because it, it's the right thing to do, if you can balance it with what the statutes and the Constitution say. I think that's a fascinating answer, and I think it also goes to some... It's too long. <laughs> but I also think that it's, uh, we have what we call interstitial decision-making, even though, say, the Commerce Clause, we did not have trains, airplanes, we did not have Amazon, but we can answer questions involving interstate commerce with Amazon today because mm -hmm. of interstitial decision-making by the court and how it would be interpreted, say, by the Commerce Clause. Would you agree with that? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And the, and the Commerce Clause has been elastic. Uh, the court has stretched it to make it a federal question, and then it has contracted really in the 1990s it contracted again starting with the Lopez case in 1995 where the court held federal Congress could not make it a crime federal crime to possess a gun within a thousand feet of a school what's interstate about that where's the federal question and uh, then more and more cases the Brady handgun control case and others came along where the federal where the Supreme Court said the Commerce Clause doesn't do everything here in fact the Affordable Care Act Obamacare it, it said in that case, the government won the case, but the court held uh, with five votes saying the Commerce Clause is violated by this, but the court held it was, it was a tax. It was a so, tax. Yeah. So with it Roberts. Wasn't really in commerce. Uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a kabuki dance, but, uh, <laughs> it, <laughs> but, but it went through. Uh, one thing that is, uh, as a political scientist and, and the American public, it's, it's on our minds right now. Um, we are very politically polarized. Um, we have not been this politically polarized since prior to the Civil War. We pl Political scientists keep tabs on these things, and it seems as if one party is against cancer, the other party is for cancer. Yeah. And one of, the, one of the questions that a lot of people are, are, are concerned about, does this sort of political party polarization spill over or pervade and eventually lead to Supreme Court decisions or the justices being, you know, having the same sort of political party division on it. A few years ago, I had lunch with a uh, retired United States senator. I, I won't name him. He's from the South. And uh, he was a blue dog Democrat. And I asked him, I said, um, all this bitter fighting that goes on on the Hill and otherwise over issues, I said, when's it going to end? And he said, uh, I see no uh, end to it at all. And I hate to be um, pessimistic like that, but people today know things instantly. Or they know things that they think are true instantly. And why is that? Well, the Internet, publications, uh, cable news, we're watching it all the time. News is developing so fast that you can't really keep up with it. So people can make their minds up about something without really knowing the facts at all. And that's one of the things. I, I wish on the internet we could get the news and it would say, this is true, <laughs> this is false, but I don't want the government doing it. Yeah. It Neither does anybody else in this audience, I don't think. I mean, governments stay out of this. And every time they start dabbling in it, they just get their fingers burned because it's, it's free speech and freedom of the press. And, and it should be that way. But we've got to be, I hate, I hate to say, but you know, better educated a better educated public would help us here. A better ed educated media. Look, I saw a headline in a newspaper one time, not the top, but below the fold, and it was about a Supreme Court decision that had just come down. And it said, Ginsburg's dissent overridden by majority. <laughs> that, that doesn't pass the third grade test. Yeah. Of course. It's overridden by the majority because it's a dissent. It's a dissent. And the article yes. was about how the court was wrong and and Justice Ginsburg was right. Uh, it's just, but you say, what are you going to do about it? Just go to the next page because it's not going to get any better until I think the media gets a little smarter and uh, quit playing so much politics and start just publishing the real news. And that publishing goes, the news. That goes 
Oh, I'm pointing my finger. So you, uh, that's interesting. So you, you see the media as um, playing a role in the political division that exists today. And, and yes, yes. I'm not saying it's bad. I, w I want them out there, but I just wish they would pull their claws in just a little bit and uh, be more factual. There's too much uh, um, news out there that's not really news. It's sort of you, you hear something and you print it and you can always retract it, but that's too late. So they need to be a little more restrained. But I understand the uh, the uh, competition that's out there and, and why they do it. But but again, if we were all better educated, um, we wouldn't have quite this problem, maybe. And sometimes partial truths are, are more dangerous than things that are patently false because there's a there's a grain of truth to what they're saying, and some people can jump on that. But I have I, I recognize that I have monopolized the time as a Supreme Court <laughs> scholar to talk to the a former clerk of the Supreme Court. I would love to I'm get a view. I'm having fun, John. I'm having I, fun. So are you. Yeah, I'm having a blast, I must say, oh, as I a Supreme Court scholar. I hope off out there. But I do want to make sure that our viewers get to ask questions as they feel, that, they, that they are very interested in. So um, I'll be glad to answer those right now and to look at what they s are asking. So our first one is from Florence Hartsfield, and it does, it does go to something that you spoke to before, and it asks, assuming Kenny, Kennedy prepared to retire during this term, do you believe that it influenced the, na the narrow opinion and masterpiece cake shop versus Colorado Civil Rights Commission? I didn't quite understand the question. Do I think that the master would it be different with with without oh. Kennedy present? I guess is is if I understand it correctly. I think almost any Supreme Court would have adhered to what I talked about earlier: avoid interpreting the Constitution or finding a new right in the Constitution, which is a little on the dangerous side, by finding another way to dispose of the case. Uh, for instance, it's best to dispose of a case if the parties come into a trial court at the last minute and say, uh, we, have, we have resolved this issue and settled the case. The judge is only too happy to say, have a nice day. We don't need more, more cases cluttering the docket. So uh, I don't think the difference would have been uh, anything. I, if I'm not mistaken, the, the decision in Master Cake was nine to nothing. Am yeah. I right? Yeah. So it wasn't really divided at all. It wasn't really a gay rights issue at all. It was, it was a freedom of religion case. Uh, two clauses, establishment clause and the free exercise clause. And did this baker uh, have the right to exercise his uh, uh, free exercise of, of religion? So that's all that case was, but it was hyped up and hyped up and hyped up. And so uh, it really wasn't big at all. Um, another question sort of sees uh, the court in terms of precedent and uh, Sometimes the Supreme Court does, as you mentioned earlier, has to step in and correct incorrect decisions in the past. And, that, and obviously that has to be done with great restraint. But some view the court in a romantic sense and hope that they will um, move the country forward in sort of a, a brave way. And, and this, the next question uh, sort of says that the court may lead the country forward. And um, I guess the, uh, Justice Ginsburg has talked a lot about this as the court is involved in sort of a dialogue with the other two branches of government. How would you respond to that question? I, I don't think it's within our frame, within the frame of our government, I don't see how you have another branch of government taking the place of the legislature. Uh, and the legislature should uh, enact our, our laws, and I don't think the Supreme Court should lead the way anyway except to just and honorable and, and decisions. Look, the court has ruled many times on laws to find them lawful, but they've sort of added in the case, uh, maybe unwise. What that means is it's stupid. <laughs> They're just being nice. But you have a right to elect people who pass laws that are, that are stupid as long as they meet the four corners of the Constitution and any statutory law, they're waving a banner. Uh, they're, not, they're not cheerleaders, and, and uh, it's not a football team. 
So I, I, I just I worry about that. They should answer the questions presented, and that's it. So if I may ask again, I think, I think that um, Congress, when they make a mistake, it's easier to it's easier to correct, yes, because um, one, they're elected, and if the public doesn't like it, they can actually vote vote the uh, people out. And the, and Congress is also more equipped to do investigations and to bring witnesses before it before it passes laws. But if the court makes a mistake, it is not as well equ as equipped to correct that mistake. Would you would you agree with that? Exactly. That's why they answer very narrow questions that are presented. That's why you only have a question presented in each case, very narrow. Sometimes during oral argument, uh, a counsel will be up pontificating and one of the justices will say, uh, uh, Mr. Herman, was that within the question presented? And what you think is, no, I'm just from Texas and I like to talk. <laughs> no, that's not good enough. Uh, it's just, no, it wasn't. Well, then don't, don't argue it here. We're deciding the question presented and that's it. So, uh, no, I, I just don't see how the court leads leads the way on anything so i the next the next question is from evan planto who wants to first thank you very much for a <laughs> tour that you gave at the supreme court a few years ago i know many of my students over the years had interned for you and um several talked about your legendary tours uh but he also asks a very important question. Do you have an, an opinion on how the current confirmation hearing process has changed over the past few decades? I guess we could probably talk about that in terms of pre and post Bork. Would you suggest that? Or do you, maybe you want to take a different angle on this? Well, I think the, the watershed was uh, uh, Judge Bob Bork in 1987 when he was, the word now is Borked, and uh, was not uh, confirmed. Uh, both parties drew their knives out and decided uh, now we're, we're really gonna we're really gonna do it uh, but before that and this has been in the paper a lot uh, Justice O'Connor was confirmed 99 to nothing Justice Scalia was confirmed 98 to nothing and the two senators absent that day were Barry Goldwater and Jake Garn oh my I think I know how they would have <laughs> voted uh, next one come along, and uh, Justice Thomas, and then Justice Ginsburg, 1993, three votes against her. The next year, Justice uh, um, uh, Breyer, I think, had nine votes, and then starts climbing more and more and more up to all now. Justice Neil Gorsuch, 45 votes against him. Look, Chief Justice John Roberts, people, some senators that voted against him are rather noteworthy. I think he had 24, 25 uh, votes against him. It was actually it's 22. Uh, but uh, uh, President Obama, Vice President Biden, uh, Secretary Clinton, Secretary Kerry, I mean, those are all later important people. As senators, they all voted against it. You don't have to have a reason to vote against it. Uh, but we've gotten away from qualifications to where we want predetermined decisions result-oriented on what's going to happen. And the, the justices just won't answer that. They call it the Ginsburg rule now, but she wasn't the first one that said that. In her confirmation, very eloquently, she said, I'm not, I can't answer that question. The, the facts could be variable. Things could be different. I don't know. And, and the senators, they all know that. Yeah. They're, they're posturing. They're just all posturing. It's political posturing. Uh, we have a question from John Seidenfeld, and he asks, how has Anita Hill's testimony affected Clarence Thomas and his place on the court? Well, I'd have to let Justice Thomas answer that, but I'll say this. I was there when he was appointed. Uh, I got to know him very, very well, worked with him on many, many things. He is very bright, uh, very engaged in what he does. He is um, uh, a people person. He knew every worker in that court. He would step on an elevator and say, hi, Sylvia, how's that new baby? And he wasn't running for office. When they're up there, they're not running for office, trust me. But everybody admired him. If you know Justice Thomas, you admire him. Uh, so how something uh, affects a person is really uh, an individual. He writes good opinions. One prominent uh, uh, politician was asked one day by the media, I won't name him, said, uh, tell, what do you think of Justice Thomas? And he says, well, he's terrible. He writes awful opinions. <laughs> the reporter was brave and he says, name one. The senator said, I'll get back to you with that. You know, that's... That's just 
I I have to say that you know I was a little I was a little concerned when Justice Thomas was appointed in that whole hearing, and then there was a dissent that he wrote in U.S. Term Limits versus Thornton. It's a uh, it's, it deals with uh, the limiting term limits on senators and in the House in Arkansas, and he wrote an 86 page dissent that was. I, w I have to I have to argue that it was masterfully written. So as someone who had prejudged him and how he acted on the court in that particular decision, there was a definite difference. And even as a political scientist, I can be sort of, you know, swayed by certain things and emotions at particular points in time. Well, uh, so the answer to this, I think, is uh, the his confirmation uh, was over and done a long time ago, and he has served uh, well and faithfully for what thirty years now. Uh, is it thirty? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and, um, a very fine justice who writes great opinions and get, gets along with everybody uh, very, very well. And our next question comes from Jeremy Rosworska, and he asks, "Does the composition of the court affect the questions presented to it?" And asking it another way, I guess he wants to make it more precise. Are activists on both sides more likely to bring certain types of cases when they believe the court's composition is in their favor? I guess they would be appealing through the surgery process at those times. Yes, I'll answer the second question. Sure, lawyers game things out there. Uh, they do it in, in lower courts. Up at the Supreme Court, it's hard to game it very much because you've got the same nine for years and years. Look, remember, from 1993 until 2004 until 2005, we had the same nine justices. That was, the, that was 11 years. That was the longest in 180 years that we had the same nine sitting there. Now, for the clerk, that was good. Yes. I knew them. They knew me. We did, <laughs> it all worked out very well. So you, you can't game that at all now. On the question presented, uh, we used to tell, I told novice lawyers, write your brief first, then write the question presented, and make it like the best dessert that you ever had, including mm. the topping. You just want to devour it. You look at it and say, this needs to be answered or our republic will fall. So it's, you have to be very good. Now, sometimes they're not well written, and the court, this is to the first question, will change the question presented, but only to articulate it better and maybe narrow it just a bit. But they don't, rarely would they add something to answer another question. People think they do it all the time, but they re really don't. And the court, I mean, I don't want to get into minutia of it, but there's the Supreme Court rules and Rule 10 clearly states what type of cases that the Supreme Court will take. Where there's, uh, where something has been, you know, there's been an egregiously wrong decision, conflict in the lower courts, in particular in the appellate courts, and of course issues of national importance. And I mean, the court really has a lot to choose from. Yes, uh, if they hear 80 cases a year, 90 cases a year out of eight to nine thousand certiorari petitions filed, your chances of getting a case heard, I guess, are better than the lottery, right? Winning the lottery, but they're not very strong. Not much better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have Jack Skull Shull writing another question. He said, we had a blip in the webinar in the beginning, and he wanted to know what was the percentage of unanimous decisions, 9-0, on uh, the it's court. A, yeah, when you talk percentages, it's over a broad, long period here. It's about 40% are unanimous. Uh, but you can take any slice of 10 years or five years and it might vary, but that, that's basically about, about 40%. And they reverse about 65% of the cases that come to them. By the way, I haven't heard from Jim Potter, uh, my basketball teammate at Trinity. I know he's out there. I saw you sign on, Jim. Now, I want everybody to know uh, Jim couldn't go left and he couldn't go right. <laughs> he's a great basketball player. That's very funny. Uh, S Sebastian Prieto asks, um, considering what you said about the SCOTUS dealing with narrow issues due to the nature of the court's responsibilities, are there, given the tumultuous political climate, any other cases besides Roe versus Wade that will be brought before the court in the near future? And obviously that's a tough one given the certiorari process and the court's appellate decision making. Uh, 
I remember last Esther Cake, but I thought that Wayfair, the tax issue, $30 billion is, is a lot of money, and money isn't everything, but it's important to the states. Another case that was decided last term that has a great impact on our labor market was Janus, J-A-N-U-S, and that was, it that reversed an uh, earlier case the court did that said a, uh, you, you could force a non-union person in certain states, this was Illinois, to pay an agency fee. Now, he or she didn't have to join the union, didn't have to pay dues, but had to pay an agency fee, even if the person didn't want to and didn't want to belong to the union, and the court struck that down. Uh, that's going to have a huge impact on, on the labor unions' uh, political uh, campaigning uh, into the, I guess, millions and millions of dollars. The issues are, aren't all settled yet, but that was a huge case. I would think uh, political science teachers and others would be teaching that up and down all day long because it's huge going from the labor movement of the, of the 20s and 30s until now, what all has happened, decreasing number of union members on the private sector, increasing number on the public sector. What, what does it all mean? It's a huge ch sea change in what's going on in, in labor law. Um, but most people, they want to talk about making a cake. Baking a cake or uh, you know, the uh, Roe versus Wade decision and sometimes the court's bureaucratic decisions, the agencies, like the Chevron decision, you know, the Chevron yeah. rule had a huge impact. Flor Florence Hartsfeld has another question and I, and I really do like it because um, someone who's a clerk of the court would really, you get, to, you get to sort of contemplate it. What do you think, how do you think Justice Kennedy will be remembered on the court? Will, will his print, imprint be indelible? Will it be as the swing vote? Uh, how will he be remembered as a Supreme Court uh, justice? I got to know Justice Kennedy very well, and I admire him. Uh, I, look, I gotta say this. I worked for 14 justices and two Supreme Court justices. I liked every one of them. I admired each one of them. I treated them with respect. They treated me and my staff with great respect. Uh, you don't find that in the uh, workplace very often. And I'm being very serious when I say that. Uh, I understood that we were um, employees of the court and we tried to do what the court wanted, but we also wanted to do what was right every time. Justice Kennedy was extremely uh, likable. It is extremely likable. He had uh, 13 years on the Ninth Circuit in California. And uh, while he was out there, he taught at night at McGeorge Law School. Uh, he really enjoyed teaching. He's a born teacher. Sometimes when he was asking questions at the, from the bench, he would be teaching a class almost. He was so good. <laughs> uh, t teachers are great. Um, and he uh, had 30 years on the Supreme Court. People say, well, why did he retire? Well, he had, that's a lot of years. And he practiced law as well. I suspect, I don't know, I haven't talked to him, but he has a large family, a wonderful wife, children, grandchildren. I wouldn't be surprised, and I, I haven't talked to him, that he goes back to California, his beloved California, and he can sit on cases on the Ninth Circuit, retired justices can do that, in Sacramento, and teach a little bit at, at the McGeorge Law School. That'd be great for that, this is a very fine school, it'd be great for the school, great for him, great for from America. Justice White did that when he retired, he went back to Denver and sat in the Byron White Courthouse How's that? You go to court every morning. It's your your building, so uh, they they can they can they can do that, and I think his departure from the court will be. Well, we still got nine justices. You don't sit around and say what would he have done. He's not forgotten, but as far as the jurisprudence, it doesn't make any difference to try to figure out uh, how would how would Tony Kennedy have voted here. It's just gone by the board, but he'll be remembered as a, a very fine justice. And I that, thank you for that answer. By the way, I got one, one thing on Justice Kennedy. Yes, please. He was he was walking back from lunch one day by himself in D.C. and got to those front steps, started up the steps, and a tourist came to him and said, Hey, buddy, would you take a picture of me and my family here? And so Justice Kennedy said, Why, well, certainly. Get up on the steps there. And this guy's got his family. He took two or three pictures, and he <laughs> handed the camera back to the tourist. He said, Have you seen any Supreme Court justices? And the tourist said, we ain't seen one of them yet. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that goes to how the public doesn't even know. Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting. Carol Covert asked a question, do you ever think that the 
decision in Citizens United will be revisited. The, the, the issue or the question presented in that particular case. Probably so. Citizens United was, was complex. And it's thrown around now as if, as if the court had ruled that corporations could go out and buy Porsche automobiles and estates for politicians and give it to them. It didn't say that at all. Uh, what it said was corporations, uh, a corporation is a person, and we knew that, the federal law says that for heaven's sakes, uh, and that they can give money for political causes. Now, they still can't give money directly to a candidate, and they can't do this and can't do that, but they can give money to that, and they can give money to pol political action committees. There are some limits on that. And uh, the, the second part of it, which uh, found a part of the McCain-Feingold McCain uh, bill uh, uh, unconstitutional, uh, dealt with uh, not not uh, being able to advertise within 60 days and 90 days of a, an election. That law, my understanding was, did not apply to unions and the media. So now, wait a minute. ABC Corporation can't influence people, but the media can run editorials up until the day before the election, and unions can give money. No, that, that just had to go. So when you say Citizens United, that has a connotation, especially if, if a liberal says it, it's bad, it's bad, corporations are going to ruin America. Look, 26 states, I believe it is, do not have any limits like that. Illinois is one of them. You can give money to candidates, a corporation can. And as far as I know, there's still states, and they haven't been flooded over, and sky didn't fall. <laughs> so I think it's a crutch that people use to, to blame the court. And, uh, and the president, I don't think, helped himself by criticizing the court in the State of the Union message in 2010 when he criticized the court when they were there. I'm not criticizing President Obama. I'm just saying I don't think it helped anybody by criticizing the court in their presence. Yeah, that's just me. And I have a, I have a question from someone that I, I imagine you know, Evan Thomas. Yes, Evan <laughs> Thomas. Yes, he said... I'm going to see you at Charlottesville in not too many months. That's what he, he, he says it's been too long since Fort Campbell, first off, and he asks a, a, a complicated question, so let me, let me say it very clearly. What is the procedure for recusal, and the recusal is important, by a justice in cases where they've been involved previously? And what is the right matter? Back. Let's do that one first. Okay. Where they've been involved, the, the court does not have a strict recusal uh, policy like the lower courts do, and let me explain why. The court tries to live by those standards but, that the circuit courts have, but here's the difference. If you're a judge on a circuit court and your fourth cousin is trying a case, you might say, you know, I don't have to get off here, but I will. First cousin, well, yeah, I, I will get off for sure. But there's a substitute judge to sit in your place. On the Supreme Court, if one is recused, you're down to eight, then to seven, then to six. And as you well know, John, six is the statutory limit for a quorum. So they recuse themselves very reluctantly. And I, I, the, by the way, they try very, very hard. The clerk's office helps them too to find out, is there anything in this case why I should uh, not be involved? He's like some prisoner that sues and lists 126 defendants. you got to watch out. Some company you own stock in might be there, uh, but it might be the soup is too cold kind of case. Not frivolous, but also not very important. So, yeah, they're, they're very careful what they do there. I have a question from Steve. Well, John, did, Evan, Evan had another one, didn't he? He did, but I have a question from Steve okay. Mock, and as a faculty member here and um, as an alumni, I, um, I really, I really uh, want you to answer this particular question because this will be helpful to me in my future at Trinity and to all of us out there. I do think Trinity offers an unparalleled education. I, I, will, I will start with that. I'm biased. I'm an educator at this university for a quarter of a century, but Steve Mock asks, thank you for your time and thoughts today, of course. Would you discuss what aspects of your Trinity education and experience were most important to your success in both your career and your, in your life in general? And I love that question, I have to say. Yeah, that would take a lot of thought and probably um, a, a pencil and paper to, to write them down, but immediately it's I started... It's next Monday, by the way. No, yeah. <laughs> huh. uh, I think about discipline. Uh, in our day there, uh, you, did, you did attend class. You weren't late to class. You attended class. You did your papers or whatever is supposed to be done, or you would hear from your professor. 
the classes were small. I understand they're still small. The professor knew me, and I knew him or her, and it wasn't sitting uh, all ticking away on our, on our laptops. It, it was it was an atmosphere of, of discipline and of honesty and forthrightness uh, and of learning. So uh, I thought we had a broad course, broad courses. We had to take English, of course, and this and that. But we we had to speak when we were called upon in class. Uh, and there was an aura about the place that we weren't there just to party. There might have been a party or two. But, <laughs> and uh, I was playing basketball as well, trying to balance everything together. And the school allowed you to do it. It was our coach told us so many times. His name was. Robbie Robinson, Leslie Robinson, a great, great man who would say, men, you're here to get an education, not just play basketball. And he really meant it. He really meant it. So uh, all those things go into Trinity. And, and Trinity hasn't changed. It, it's not a brainwashing outfit. Uh, it's not just a diploma mill. It's old school. And uh, I think that's a good thing. Yeah, and I know that we've talked. And I, every time I talk to an alumni, there seems to be a common denominator of a former professor in a department of history, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Everett, and it seems that oh, he's yeah. left an indelible imprint. I hear he wore lots of polyester too, by the way. That's what some, some people tell me. But it, it, it's, it's, type, it's professors like that that make your memory of Trinity so fond. Is that, is that correct? Oh yes, Doc, Dr. Dr. Donald Everett was a great teacher of history. My wife Jeannie and I took every course we could from him. Uh, he would bring his son to basketball games. Uh, and when you wrote a paper for him, it would be returned to you with red ink all over it, and you had to make not just make corrections, but he would say, elaborate on this, expand this, and you had to write the paper again and again until you got it right. And I'll have to say this, he, he was like a, a, a father to both Jeannie and me, and in my senior year, he thought I should go to law school. I had no plans to go to law school at all. I was going to go in the Army and do my best there. But he single-handedly got to Tulane, uh, I'm sure, to give me a full scholarship, yeah. educational scholarship. He had gotten his doctorate at Tulane, and one of the best things uh, ever happened to me in my life was being able to go to law school, and it was solely Dr. Everett. And he did, did that for many, many, many students. He's, he's a great legend of Trinity. It, um, I have a question from a current student of mine, an, an academic advisee. He noticed that, um, in large part, uh, you know, justices should, you know, act independently of party affiliation, but as the confirmation hearings reveal party identification and the party will be determined by who is in favor in the Senate and who is not in favor in the Senate. He wanted to know, would you do anything to change those confirmation hearings in the future in terms of the partisan bent and how politically polarized the Senate currently is and, and, our, and, and our nation when it comes to confirmation hearings, hearings and the Supreme Court justices? Uh, I, I share his concern to the student. You know, I don't think there's anything that uh, we can do. The senators themselves or the body or the committee will have to do it themselves. One is to, I'm not going to say the word behave, but they also could adhere to the to the, to the rules of decorum and conduct and try, try to find out is this person qualified or not. And uh, it, it had gone far beyond that. Both parties have done this. I'm blaming both parties. And uh, it's um, uh, very discouraging to see it. But, but what will happen, um, we'll, we'll, we'll grow out of this. We'll grow out of it. Okay, thank you for your answer. Are, are we good on time or? It's like so two minutes. We have about two minutes left. I want to I want to thank you so much for your time and sharing um, your time with with all our viewers today. And um, I want to thank you for spending time with me again. Um, well, I greatly appreciate it. It's always an honor and a pleasure to talk with you. And I always learn something new in our conversations. Well, John, thank you, and thank you for what you do. All of the staff and professors at Trinity. Uh, I know it's a hard job, but it must be a little easy when you're on that beautiful campus with great students and leadership and, and really great alumni out there to uh, supporting the effort that, that you're making. So Jeannie and I both send our best wishes to everybody out there in TV land who tuned in today. I'm still disappointed Jim Potter didn't ask me a question, but that, Jim, you can, you can call me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I also want to say that our next webinar 
is scheduled for October 25th at noon central. And it's on something that you might be very interested in. We touched upon this today. It's on communication in an era of fake news. And it will feature a live conversation with two faculty members that I admire very much at Trinity, actually, Dr. Jennifer Henderson and Dr. Aaron Delwich, who are professors at of the Department of Communication at Trinity University. I hope that everyone will join that webinar. And I want to thank you very much um, for your time again. And I hope you have my email. You're always welcome to tell me how you're doing. I want to be kept abreast of all our alumni's progress. Thanks, John. Thank you.